Good evening and welcome to the Johns Hopkins University Writing Webinar, Clear and Concise Technical Writing, led by Charlotte O'Donnell. JHU offers free writing webinars to engineering for professionals, students, once a semester. I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Charlotte O'Donnell. Charlotte teaches technical and professional writing at Johns Hopkins University. She has worked as a journalist and as a technical writer and editor, publishing across a wide range of topics and disciplines from medical journal articles to education policy handbooks. Johns Hopkins Engineering is pleased to present this writing webinar that will cover techniques for writing more clearly and concisely about technical content. Great, thank you, Sandra, for that introduction. I'm gonna share my screen, just clicking some buttons here. Okay, so hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Charlotte and I'm gonna be leading you through this webinar this evening. Um, I thought as a way of getting started, I would begin by polling the group uh, with this question. Uh, I'd like to ask you guys how many hours per week you spend reading at work. Uh, and you've got a couple options here. You can read A is less than five hours a week, B is five to 10, C is 10 to 20, and D is gonna be more than 20 hours a week. I've gotta click on a button and um, launch this, let's see, hold on. Launch this poll. So go ahead and vote and tell me how many hours a week do you spend reading at work? Oh, good. I'm seeing all the data coming in right now. We're getting close to 50. We're at about 40. 42 of you have responded. Good. Okay. And so I'll end the poll now and I'll share the results with you. And so it looks like we've got a range of people all over the map that are, sparing, or that are spending a, a various amount of time reading at work. Um, and I think uh, this, is, this is useful to know, right? Because um, in many ways, we're, we're writing to communicate to our readers. I'm going to stop sharing the poll now. And I'm going to ask you another um, question uh, that builds on the first question. The second question is how much of what you read is well written? <laughs> this is a very different, <laughs> very different kind of question. And A is 100% is super well written, B is about 70%, C is 50%, D is 30%. And we're about half the group has responded to the poll. Give another 10 seconds or so for people to answer. Good, okay. So um, I'm going to share the poll with you. And you can see uh, the majority of you guys say that, like, you are obviously encountering a lot of written material that's not super well written for a huge portion of your working day. So I'll stop sharing this poll. Um, so I'm hoping if you can put these two questions together in your mind, what you'll realize is that bad writing, it wastes a lot of time, right? Um, and in addition, bad writing causes a lot of other problems at work. In case some of you guys are thinking more deeply about it or interested in thinking more deeply about it. Um, why does the writing at work matter? Well, it does more than just um, waste a lot of time of the people around you that are reading your work. It, it also does things, according to a Harvard study, that affect the business on a larger level. So if you think about it more holistically, uh, bad writing, it frequently does things like dilute leadership. If your boss is writing a document that's unclear and the document is meant to communicate to a wide base of employees, um, then a lot of times the employees will end up being confused. And if the employees are confused enough, they're going to lose faith in the boss and that the boss is making the right decisions. In addition to that, the Harvard study on this particular principle talks about how bad writing obviously destroys customers' faith in your company or a brand um, or your engineering firm, as the case may be. 
Um, if customers don't understand what your product is about, what your service is about, what your project is about that you're partnering with them on, um, then they're going to have a hard time figuring out why you're doing what you're doing. And when they can't trust that you do what they think you say you're going to do, then they'll lose faith. They won't want to work, work with you anymore. They won't want to buy your product. Um, and lastly, and I, I think of this last option as sort of the inverse of point number one, um, bad writing at work in many ways makes management way less effective. Um, and you can think of this sort of uh, from the opposite perspective um, of the leader at the top who's writing to the employees underneath. Think about all the employees underneath that are sort of writing in kind of like a middling way, like sort of clear, but sort of not clear. Yes, it's wasting a lot of the boss's time when they're sort of trying to sort through what these various employees' documents mean. Um, but in addition to that, when the boss is sort of trying to gather what the employees underneath him are trying to say, a lot of times he's probably going to misunderstand what they're trying to communicate to him. And those misunderstandings over time, they can lead to some pretty poor decision making. Um, I see there's probably a bunch of stuff going on in the chat field, but in order to sort of get through this presentation, um, I'm going to probably ignore the chat field until about the end. Um, if you guys are having technical issues, though, definitely tap Haley. Haley will help you, and I will hopefully be able to check out your questions at the end once I've gotten through a certain amount of this content. Um, so, so yes, so bad writing has all of these impacts on any kind of business and any kind of working team. Um, there's a certain kind of engineer that I work with, although thankfully they're getting more and more rare out there in the world. But those engineers, some of them believe that, you know, your success at work, um, it's based mainly on the quality of your ideas. Maybe they say they're not great at writing, but they'll make up for it with math or perhaps with clearer diagrams. But the truth of the matter is that these days, um, it's more and more and more important for STEM professionals from the whole range of fields out there that they be able to use written language really, really well in order to communicate their ideas. And in fact, usually what makes or breaks a project is the caliber of their communication skills frequently in writing, which is challenging, right? So what I'm going to do um, over the course of this presentation is I'm actually I'm going to open with a little bit of a story um, about um, a communication problem that happened in a company at GM, as you may see here from this slide. Um, and this, this particular techni com technical communication failure, um, it caused all of the problems from the Harvard study and much, much more, to be quite frank. Um, I'm going to walk you through what happened and why it happened. And as I walk you through why it happened, I'm also hopefully going to show you guys how to do things better. Um, and hopefully you can learn from GM's mistakes and take these lessons with you into your own working lives after you leave the webinar here tonight. So, okay, to get started, I'm just gonna silence this. The story really begins at GM in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and at that period of time, GM was in a lot of trouble. Uh, right in that time period, uh, GM posted a $10.6 billion loss, and they had to cut like literally 30% of their workforce. It was a really tragic time for them. Um, and this was happening because, you know, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, um, GM was known for its manufacturing of trucks and SUVs, and those vehicles were really popular. But as we enter into the 90s, fuel efficiency becomes more important to consumers. Um, and what GM doesn't really have are many popular small cars. Um, and they come to sort of realize that they need a good small car in order to compete in the automotive industry. Um, what they've been known for in the past, they have like one small car or a couple of small cars, I guess, like one is the Chevy um, Cavalier. And it's kind of known for being cheap and cheerful, but it's not really slick. It's not really popular. No one wants cheap and cheerful. What they want is something that's sort of like a European style touring car, something that's like a little sexy, that um, has a little bit more like power on the road, that handles more in a more agile way. Um, and so 
GM goes out on a limb and they say, okay, we really, we need to develop a car like this. And what they decide to do is they come up with a plan for a car called the Chevy Cobalt. Some of you guys might be familiar with the Chevy, Chevy Cobalt. The idea of the Chevy Cobalt in many ways was spot on. It was a brilliant idea. It was an idea that was going to save GM. But in practice, even from the get-go, in the prototyping stages, the Chevy Cobalt suffered from a lot of problems, and in particular, a lot of problems around the ignition system in the vehicle. Um, and so I'm gonna take you a little bit into the long saga of the ignition switch on the Chevy Cobalt. Bear with me. So the Chevy Cobalt's ignition switch it actually began to be developed um, in 1997. This was sort of well before the Chevy Cobalt was launched. Um, and it was developed as a common part uh, to be shared with the Saturn Ion. Right at that time, Chevy had recently acquired Saturn. Um, and so the idea was to use the ignition switch from the Saturn Ion in the Chevy Cobalt as well, because they were relatively similarly sized cars. Um, and the switch itself was designed to be more cheaply produced and also more reliable. There'd been some issues with the switch's ability to start the car in the past. Also, apparently, it had a habit of setting on fire every now and again. So they were like, well, we don't really want that to happen anymore. So we're going to design a more sophisticated switch. Um, the switch was more sophisticated, but not more successful. Um, the switch, in order to be produced cheaply and to be more effective, they designed it in a way that was much more electrically complicated. Um, it had multiple points of electrical contact within the switch. And um, though that was supposed to um, make it communicate more effectively with the communication network across the car, um, it didn't really communicate any more effectively. In fact, there were all kinds of electrical problems with the switch from the start. Um, and if anything, all of, all of those electrical points of contact within the switch, what it really achieved was creating less space for some of the mechanical components, which made it a real challenge for the design engineers that were tasked with figuring out what to do with this part. Um, so, even when the switch was sort of going through prototyping, the electrical concept of the switch, um, it, they needed to fuss with it a lot. Everyone on the engineering team had to do a lot of adjustments. It, it just, it wasn't communicating with the system in the way that they thought it would. The electrical current wasn't traveling through the switch in the way that they thought it would. Um, and so that had to be redesigned a number of times. Um, and then as they sort of got to the later stages of the prototyping of this particular part, what they found in addition um, was that there, there's this part inside the switch. It's basically like a metal groove um, that is a, it's responsible for holding the switch in a particular position from start um, to accessory to off. Um, anyway, these little grooves in the switch called detentes, they were too shallow. Um, and so because they were too shallow, there's a component that basically presses into the groove. Um, and the shallowness of the groove meant that the switch didn't hold its place. Um, and it, it uh, sometimes was caught sort of in this weird in-between position, like engineers found that the switch sometimes sat between start and accessory or between off and accessory, which is obviously not a thing that you want to do. Um, so anyway, so they eventually have to totally redesign the switch um, with different tools. Um, and uh, there's some other things that are coming up too. They notice at the same time they're redesigning the grooves in the switch, the detente, that even after they redesign the grooves, the torque requirement on the switch isn't quite right. It's supposed to be, um, it's supposed to take a certain amount of force to turn the switch from off to accessory to like crank and start. And it's almost like if you very, very gently brush your hand against the key, it moves too easily between these positions, which is sort of troubling. But this particular problem, it gets a little bit lost in the fray. They have a couple of conversations with it between the engineering teams and the manufacturer that they're outsourcing this part to. Um, and then uh, someone drops the ball, essentially, and they kind of forget about it. Um, and the, the switch gets uh, installed into a vehicle and it gets released with the ION as its standard part when the ION is launched in 2002. Um, 
And even after the, the ion is launched and they think they've solved all the problems, there are even more problems with the switch, problems they hadn't anticipated. Suddenly it's no longer that the switch is sort of between stages. Uh, now it's that the switch actually does not start the vehicle like they want it to, in particular in cold weather. So then the next two years, they basically um, spend trying to figure out how to fix this cold weather starting problem. Actually, at first, they really are having a lot of debates amongst themselves about why the car isn't starting to begin with. A lot of the teams don't agree on like uh, what the cause is of the cars not starting. And it's only after uh, one of the engineers actually goes to the trouble to uh, build a refrigerated cargo carrier and drive an ion into the cargo carrier and test the switch in cold weather that they come to the conclusion that it's the cold weather that's messing up the ability of the switch to turn on the car. Um, so they do eventually fix it in 2004. They redesign the switch yet one more time. They're pretty embarrassed about it. In particular, the lead design engineer uh, takes this like fifth or seventh redesign of the switch as um, a mark of personal failure. He feels really ashamed of this. Um, but, you know, they've got to go forward. Uh, they don't have any other plans for what to do with the ignition switch for the Cobalt. And so the Cobalt launches in 2004. Um, with this ignition switch. I should say that at some point between 2001 and 2004, there was another problem in the background just to add to the chaos of this story. And that problem was that some engineers when they were testing the vehicle and some consumers after they shortly, uh, shortly after they purchased the vehicle, after it was released to the public, they were starting to notice that the car was turning off while they were driving. And that obviously is really troubling, right? Um, so the, the descriptions of these scenarios sort of go like, well, the driver is driving on a main street in town, or in some cases on the highway. And what tends to happen is the driver accidentally bumps the key fob that's sitting in the ignition. And this little bit of jiggling of the key in the ignition is enough to actually turn the switch from the run position back to either accessory or off, at which point the car loses all power and the driver, if they're um, the panicked type, uh, maybe doesn't handle the vehicle so well. Um, so shortly after the Cobalt launches, they start getting many, many more of these reports coming in. Before, these reports had come in, but they'd sort of been ignored uh, because they were really trying to focus on the no crank, no start in cold weather. But now they're starting to pile up. Um, and uh, between 2004 and 2009, um, they get a number of reports. And some of the engineers on the team start to get a hold of these reports. And they start to take them more seriously. There is, just to carry on with a the general theme, a lot of confusion amongst the engineering teams about what is causing this particular problem this time. And the engineering teams start to bounce around a bunch of crazy theories about what is causing these moving stalls. Um, a lot of the engineering teams, they have a particular theory that this is, I, I, they don't understand why it's coming up so frequently in these reports or why people are making such a big deal out of it, but they really think that these incidents are rare and they only happen in a very limited circumstance um, like say with a, a several sort of key key events happening at the same time, like the driver turns on the blinker and is accelerating between 40 and 50 miles an hour and has like turned the steering wheel to the left or like uh, the car is uh, strangely in neutral and the radio is on or so anyway, they, they have theories like this, that it's really like a confluence of several very small things that a normal driver wouldn't do at the same time. Um, and so when these incidents come to an internal review committee that is responsible for dealing with um, the problems and remedying them if they pose a risk to the general public, what this review committee tends to do, it looks at the problem, it's sort of listening to the um, various lower level engineering teams sort of bickering back and forth with one another. They don't fully understand what the lower level engineering teams are saying, or sometimes it's like the lower level engineering teams, they're not really like interpreting the facts. They're just sort of like sending very neutral, very objective reports up to the top. And the people at the top on this review committee, they're under enormous amount of pressure to push this car through production and to keep it viable, right? Because the success of GM really depends on the success of this vehicle. And so 
um, each of these review panels, there are four of them between 2004 and 2009, they come back and they say, well, um, we really don't think that this is an issue of customer safety. We think this is an issue of customer convenience. We think it's rare. And beyond that, it's not a good business case. So we don't think it's wise for us to do anything. We're basically going to ignore them. So that happens. Um, and this, all this sort of squabbling is going on and no one's really doing anything. And then secretly, um, without telling anyone, the lead design engineer on the switch in 2006 realizes that he made a mistake. Um, he realizes in the course of a couple of newer conversations with um, the company that's producing the switch for him that he had dropped the ball early on in the process, probably in the early 2000s, and had failed to give direction to the manufacturer to adjust the torque of the switch in its earliest stages of development. And so now he's in this position where he's really, he's covering his tracks because these reports are coming in and people are getting into accidents. And beyond that, they're getting into accidents and the airbags aren't deploying and there's even more confusion about the airbags not deploying um, but what this means is that people's lives are being jeopardized and this um, lead engineer realizes that uh, something has to be done but he doesn't really want to cop to it yes I should say he's never admitted this publicly this is just what most analysts say um, when they examine this case um, and anyway um, so he secretly, uh, in the process of the latest redesign that's supposed to fix, fix the like 10% of, um, of the no crank, no start problems that were sort of left over, um, he redesigns the switch secretly and doesn't update the part number. So nobody knows that the switch is just a totally new part. Um, and after 2006, it is a totally new switch that's 100% fixed. Um, but because GM doesn't really know what's going on and that there is an earlier problem with the switch because the lead engineer didn't say anything, they continue to sort of go about their business um, treating this problem like it's a non-problem all the way up until 2011 um, when a lawyer files a lawsuit on behalf of a family who lost their daughter in a car crash. And this lawyer actually goes to the trouble to take the ignition switch out of the vehicle um, and he actually sends it to an independent analyst who analyzes the switch and the torque in the switch and it comes back and the analyst is like, whoa, 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 this switch is like, it's, it's too, too soft. It moves way too quickly between these particular positions. Um, and that's clearly the reason why your daughter's vehicle shut off on the highway and she careened over the side rail and the car tumbled and she died. Um, so... Um, the lawsuit is filed and the lawsuit finally gets GM's attention. GM starts to do some investigating and executives at the top are like, ooh, something seems kind of fishy here. Um, so GM hires an external investigator to investigate its own people. That's what it takes to sort of get to the bottom of this. Um, and it's only after the investigator comes back after like I think six or eight months investigating with a verdict that says GM has in fact done some wrong that GM recalls 2.7 million vehicles. Just to give you a sense of some of the specifics of the components that I'm talking about here, um, this is a diagram of the ignition switch and you can kind of see uh, where the key goes in the ignition slot and the key slot. This, I mean, obviously you guys are familiar where the key is in your car. It's mounted to the steering column of your car. And when you turn the key, it turns a shaft sort of uh, deeper in the steering, steering column, which eventually turns a component towards the back of the switch. Um, and the, the shifting of components at the back of the switch call, um, cause uh, a piece of the switch called the detente plunger um, to click into various slots in the switch. These are the grooves in the switch I was talking about. Um, and they're called the detentes. So um, the detente plunger, it's, it's basically like a little metal cap that's mounted on a spring. And it presses into the groove in the metal plate um, and when the key has enough force exerted on it, it will slide out of one groove and into the next. But it presses hard enough, right, that it stays in the slot unless you exert a certain amount of force on the key. Um, 
<clears throat> and so you can sort of see how it works down there below. I should say that possibly one of the most tragic things about this case is that the fix of um, the ignition switch, really all they needed to do to fix it was to replace the detente plunger from the original part um, designed in like the early 2000s with um, a part that was much, uh, or not even much, just like a little bit longer. Um, and the the detente plunger that was just a little bit longer exerted just a little bit more force into those slots and it held the key in place so that it no longer moved when you bumped uh, the key with your knee. Um, I should note to the original part, part of I think one of the things that um, kept them from doing this immediately uh, was that it was just created with an off the shelf kind of spring, something they could get really easily and cheaply. The replacement part did have to involve a custom spring uh, that the engineering firm designed um, themselves. Um, but even with this, um, the difference in cost of the vehicle with the old part and the vehicle with the new part was really just a matter of cents. Um, so just like less than a dollar. Um, and is that less than a dollar worth all of the trouble the switch caused? Probably not. Um, I thought it might be fun for you guys to guess at this um, now that I've described this full incident. How much do you think this incident cost GM? I'm gonna launch this poll now. Um, was it just 124 people died and 275 people were injured? Was it 2.7 million vehicles recalled? Was it 2.6 billion in penalties from the federal government and settlement costs? Or was it all of the above? <laughs> I'm hoping that you see it was all of the above. It was really just an outrageous amount of money um, that went into um, both fixing this problem in the end um, and fixing the company as, as a whole, because clearly it, it um, it showed some, some major flaws, I think, in management and in uh, the communication style. And so congratulations, you all did really well on this multiple choice question. Um, what I have to say sort of beyond this is that um, this this problem clearly it had it had many causes right um, and sure their failures in leadership and their failures in management um, and there might have been failures in moral courage in some circumstances um, but one of the primary causes of, of this massive problem at GM was really a failure of technical communication um, and I think probably like the primary like theme to this like failure of communication at GM um, had to do with the culture of communication that um, many executives and mid-level engineering managers were sort of fully enmeshed in at the time. And this is, um, it's a cultural phenomenon that I, I see really um, across a, a lot of engineering disciplines. And it's, it's one that I try to sort of like illuminate um, to hopefully encourage you guys to do a little bit better. And this is maybe um, a simplified way of explaining it, but uh, what I say uh, frequently when I'm teaching communication is that there is a kind of like cult of very serious uh, STEM writing that exists out there. Um, and when you write in this style of very serious STEM writing, what you're doing as a writer is you're, you're sort of prioritizing in your writing process this idea that um, it's not so much how clear you're being, it's, um, it's that you're being taken seriously. And so what you do instead of prioritizing clarity is like in many ways, especially if you feel not confident about your writing, um, you might really just choose to write like how you think other people write or how they sound. Um, sometimes you write in a way that's a little bit defensive um, in the case of the lead design engineer for the switch who failed to reveal anything about the changes in the part in 2006, he wrote to intentionally obscure what was going on. Um, but none of these are good ways to approach the writing process. I, and I hopefully all of you guys agree with me on this, uh, really feel that it is incredibly important when you're writing about technical material, which is already so hard to understand um, on its own, you have to approach it prioritizing clarity. Um, there is no reason that technical writing can't be made easy for an audience to understand. It's perhaps a more complicated process figuring out how to communicate clearly, but there's nothing inherently special about sentences that describe technical content versus sentences that describe 
non-technical content. And so I'm gonna try to persuade you of this case over the next couple of slides. Um, don't write like Ray DiGiorgio, who eventually got fired and could be argued was responsible for the death of like 150 people. You know this. Um, when, I, when I talk about clear technical communication, um, what I'm talking about sort of in a broader sense uh, is clear formal communication, clear formal language. And I think a lot of the confusion about like how we write as a STEM professional stems from a certain kind of muddiness, a certain kind of confusion um, with the difference between formal and informal language. Sometimes um, STEM professionals will write in a certain way uh, because they think that writing in a different way is informal, but let me sort of walk you through uh, what formal language is not so that we can work towards a formal technical communication um, that is more effective. So, Formal language should not be hard to understand. There's nothing about formal language that demands that. Formal language should not necessarily be filled with jargon or long words. That doesn't mean it can't involve jargon or long words, but they're not always necessary to communicate technical content. Um, formal language does not necessarily use the passive voice. It might use some of the passive voice, but I actually have a very particular point to make about the passive voice later. Wait for it. Um, and formal language, and this is one that I see a lot too, I'm not going to focus a lot of time on it, but formal language isn't really meant to be so deferential that the reader loses the point in sort of like apologies or softening of statements or avoiding um, sort of um, making a kind of persuasive argument about data. It, it, formal language is none of these things. The point of formal language is still clear communication. The goal is really understanding, and you should never lose track of that point. What we mean when we talk about formal language versus informal language is that formal language, just in terms of how it's different from informal language, it's, it's really, it's adopting the voice of the company or the larger organization. And because it's adopting the voice of the company or the larger organization, um, it tends to be a little more neutral. You could think of it as like the averaging of a couple of different point of views. How do you speak to everyone? Well, perhaps there's a little bit less expression of um, individual ideas. Um, it's also um, clearly less casual. Uh, because if you're not writing as an individual, you don't have a personal relationship with the reader, right? Um, and so because you don't have a personal relationship established, um, it's probably a safer bet that you write in a way that you're pretty sure doesn't offend them. Um, you're pretty sure the reader is always reading your work and doesn't at any time feel like you're mocking them or treating you like, um, they're treating them like perhaps um, they don't know what you're talking about. Um, it treats the reader uh, like a beautiful person, um, and it treats the reader like someone who absolutely deserves um, to understand the content that the writing is presenting quickly and easily. Uh, so to that end, I think when we talk about clear formal communication, clear formal technical communication, like writing a long report, long reports, which were probably passed between different engineering teams at GM. Um, one of the first things we have to think about are sentences that are clear and direct. And you've probably had some uh, either advisors or perhaps bosses talk to you at different points of time, points in time about what we mean when we talk about clear and direct sentences. I have a little spiel uh, that breaks it down. Um, and the way I like to describe it is that clear and direct sentences um, focus on characters and on actions. Um, so <clears throat> let me show you what I mean by that in particular. I'm just gonna move some things out of the way so I can see, good. Um, so here's an example of a sentence that's not clear and direct. And one of the reasons it's not clear and direct is it does not have an emphasis on a character in the subject and a really vivid verb in the verb part of the sentence. Um, a lot of times this will happen when we turn a verb into a noun in our sentence. And so here you'll notice the first word of this sentence is failure. Failure is a noun, it's an idea. It's not something we can see. It's not that it's a bad word in and of itself, but 
they've sort of measured this, linguists have measured how readers understand English. And what they have come to discover is that readers always understand an English sentence better when the subject is a concrete either object or, or person. If the subject word in the sentence is like a we, or is like an engineer, or is um, say some sort of technical instrument, that's gonna be much quicker um, for the reader to process than it will be if the subject is something like failure. The verb is also going to put the subject in motion more for the reader if the verb is like a strong and dramatic verb. Um, so fail is a strong and traumatic verb, um, but versions of the verb like to be or to seem, those are weaker, they're more general, they're softer, they're less precise. So you can see, I'm going to move through here, and this is the original sentence. Failure of the DLIS per Torque Specification 3.22.356 in the vicinity of uh, 20 NCM in the written technical design documentation has severely threatened the timeline of the vehicle's GVD process approval. Okay, so there are a lot of words there, and there are a lot of acronyms, which I think a lot of people intuit aren't the best thing. Um, but even sort of putting acronyms aside, the thing that will begin to clarify the sentence more for the reader to make it easier is if that ignition switch, which is a thing we can hold in our hands, right? That becomes the subject of the sentence. So here I've just spelled out the acronym for you. The discrete logic ignition switch fails to produce the 20, it's Newton centimeters of torque described in the technical design or in technical design specification 3.22.356. And this problem threatens the global vehicle development timeline. Uh, this is clearer. It is actually two more words, but only because I spelled out the acronyms. The rest of the language in the sentence um, above has actually been reduced. I should say here, though, um, in technical writing, if you can get away with still being clear, still communicating the concept clearly, um, but removing some of the jargon, um, it's preferable to do that. So here, a modified version of the sentence above is much simpler, much more direct, and probably the one that's gonna get your point across most clearly to an engineering team or to an executive. Um, and the example is, the switch fails to produce the torque described in the technical specifications, and this problem threatens the vehicle launch date, which is actually what's meant by global vehicle development timeline. Um, as GM brought a vehicle closer and closer to launch to the general public, they had a particular approval process. It had to go through a round of tests, actually several rounds of tests, and they called this GVD. So now you get the gist. Uh, try to write sentences with more concrete subjects and more dramatic verbs. Second tip uh, to do to create clearer and more concise sentences is to use the active voice. I know this might be controversial. Um, what I find when I teach this particular principle, though, and I work with a lot of uh, famous PIs across uh, Johns Hopkins, a lot of people doing very, very legitimate research. Some of them are somewhat adverse to this principle, but what I find they're adverse to more than anything is actually use of the we. Um, I actually strongly encourage my students to use the we because when you use a we at the beginning of your sentence, that is a concrete subject that the reader can grapple with, can, can understand immediately, they can visualize it in their brain. Um, and from that point, um, they, um, they will be able to interpret the rest of the sentence more clearly. Um, this sentence up here is a particular kind of uh, sentence that's called passive voice lacking the actor. Um, and in passive voice lacking the actor, the true subject or character of the sentence is actually dropped out. The person or thing performing the action doesn't exist. The action just happens. You might remember George W. Bush's famous sentence about the Iraq War, mistakes were made. There are obviously reasons why he chose to say the sentence that way, but there are also many critics uh, that have criticized him for using a sentence like that because it's very important, in their opinion, that he own the particular decisions that he, he made um, leading up to the Iraq War. So anyway, this back to engineering um, is a, an example of passive voice lacking the actor. 
And I'll read you the sentence. The 2007 switch design was changed, but was not recorded on form 3660. And because that form is responsible for triggering a work order for a new part, it resulted in the fact that it maintained the same part number as the switches in the 2004 to 2006 vehicle model years. So this, um, I mean, you can parse it, but it takes you a lot longer than you need to. And if you're going to be a good writer, you want the reader's understanding to be instant. So a quick fix to actually, one, reduce language, and two, make the reader understand more instantly is to switch it to active voice. So a revised version of the sentence is, though the lead engineer changed the design of the switch in 2007, he failed to document those changes by describing them on form 3660 and requesting a new part number. So moving on from that, just like one more tip in addition to characters and actions, I should say you probably noted too, it reduced the language um, in those sentences. Passive voice reduces the language naturally, makes you more concise, more direct. The last thing has less to do with reducing the amount of language and more to do with the order of your words. Um, when you're writing clear and direct sentences, it's really important that your subject and your verb are close together. You want your subject to come right away and you want your verb to follow immediately. Or if you can't have your subject right away, you wanna make sure that your subject and your verb are in the middle of the sentence, but not far apart. The farther apart they get, the more challenging it's gonna be for the reader to understand. What do I mean by this? Well, here's an example. Um, Delphi Engineers, this is actually the, the company that was responsible for manufacturing the switch. Uh, Del Delphi Engineers in 2007 redesigned the switch, presumably, uh, presumably at the request of Ray DiGiorgio, replacing the old 10.6 millimeter detente plunger with a longer 12.2 millimeter detente plunger. Um, and a revised version of this sentence will look like this. In 2007, presumably at the request of Ray DiGiorgio, Delphi engineers redesigned the switch, replacing the old 10.6 millimeter detente spring plunger with a longer 12.2 millimeter detente spring plunger. You'll notice I moved a lot of the qualifying phrases about the timeline um, and sort of the conditions under which the action happened to the front of the sentence so that engineers and redesigned can be really close together. So, I'm gonna launch another poll, sort of testing you on these last three principles of clear and concise uh, sentence level writing. Which of these two sentences is likely to be read as clearer? If it may please the review committee, the ignition switch group would kindly like to draw your attention to section 3.2.2.1 of the specification, which governs the tactile characteristics of the switch, which include target displacement curve of 20 Newton centimeters as the needed torque to move from run position to accessory position, or is it B, according to the technical documentation, a user needs to exert 20 Newton centimeters of torque to turn the switch from the run position to the accessory position. Beautiful, I'm seeing everybody's choosing B. You guys are obviously incredibly intelligent, but I'm glad that you are following me through this writing tutorial. I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. Thank you to all 37 of you who participated. You are making this class much more interesting for me. Always love some data. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna stop sharing this so that I can actually put one more question up here on the screen. I'm gonna give you another option. Um, which of these two sentences is clearer? Um, is it A, the electrical concept for the switch between 2001 and 2005 was redesigned by Ray DiGiorgio several times? Or B, Ray DiGiorgio had to design the electrical concept for the switch several times between 2001 and 2005? Good, I'm seeing a lot of results coming in. I won't give it away. And just for the sake of time, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. Um, and most of you guys were totally right. Um, 
sentence B is clearer because it follows that principle of subject and verb coming closer together. Um, sentence A, you'll notice um, you've got this weird phrase between 2001 and 2005. It's, it's splitting up various parts of the sentences in a way that makes it more challenging. And so um, things to practice if you had a moment of confusion, but also this is absolutely the kind of topic that is best learned by practicing um, with a tutor that can guide you through it or your advisor if the case may be. Uh, so my next sort of tip um, for writing more, more clearly about technical content um, when we're sort of moving beyond sentence level ideas is um, to think about uh, what your audience that you're writing to knows and what they don't know. What you want to target when you're explaining concepts is material or ideas that they already easily understand. I say this, and a lot of times I think what I find is that engineers, um, they think that all technical audiences are created equal, and they forget that technical audiences come from a lot of different backgrounds, and especially when you sort of get high up into advanced training in certain engineering disciplines, um, it, you can forget a lot of what the other disciplines do. Yes, you do share some sort of like baseline knowledge about engineering principles, but when you're writing, even to other highly smart, highly educated technical audiences, you shouldn't assume that they know exactly the same things that you do. And you should think for like more than a minute about where their understanding of your particular concept that you want to communicate, where it begins and where it ends. Because if you start somewhere that's outside of their understanding, you might think you're communicating clearly, but really they may just be totally missing your point. Um, so what do I mean by this? Here's an example. Imagine that you're in one engineering team and you're trying to describe the airbag problem during the crashes to another engineering team. Um, and um, for whatever reason, the older engineering team, they may be in charge of making an important technical decision. Um, you have experience with the, the newer airbag system. Um, they do not have experience with the newer airbag system and the airbag system has changed substantially. So when you're communicating to them, if you're on the new team, it behooves you not to write the sentence to the older team in this way. You shouldn't just say what the new system does, which is what this sentence says. Here's the sentence. I'll read it to you. When the switch turns to the accessory position, this initiates a multipoint electrical contact, which triggers a low voltage signal to the BCM, which in turn triggers the SDM, which performs various calculations on vehicle speed and velocity before terminating operation. I mean, this is true, but I think what you'll see when I put up the revised sentence is that if you're communicating this to a group that's not dealt with the new switch or the, the new airbag system, they're going to miss the meaning of like what you mean by terminating operation. Because what essentially happened when they redesigned the airbag system and the ignition system in the early 2000s used to be that you could be sitting in a car and something could hit you and your airbag would go off because it was not dependent on the car being fully turned on. If you don't describe this and point this out to the team that doesn't have experience with the new system, they're absolutely going to miss it. So the revised sentence that's probably going to speak to them more clearly and help them understand what the heck is going on is this one. When the switch turns to the accessory position, this routes signal to the new sensory diagnostic module, SDM 1.1 a recently updated communication module that is designed to operate more safely than its predecessor, Sensory Diagnostic Module 1.0. SDM 1.1 reacts more quickly than SDM 1.0. It takes only 300 milliseconds to analyze the vehicle's current velocity and speed. Also, unlike SDM 1.0, the new SDM receives a signal that the ignition, once the new SDM receives a signal, uh, that the ignition switch has moved out of run. It runs its last velocity analysis and then completely powers down all associated safety systems. This is so the airbags don't explode in parked vehicles. Do you see how this is clearer? This is filling in a gap in knowledge. I hope you do, because we're going to move on. 
And I'm going to ask you guys which of these passages communicates uh, the problem more clearly, this time to a different audience. Imagine that you're that same technical team with knowledge of what the airbag system does now, and you've got to communicate it to someone with business experience sitting on the safety review panel. What do, uh, let me move this poll, what do you choose? And I'm going to launch this poll and you can check it out. Passage A is just the same as it was for the last slide to give you a hint. <laughs> when the switch runs, when the switch turns to the accessory position, this in initiates a multi-port circuit contact, blah, 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 blah. B, the ignition switch is essentially an on-off switch for the car's entire electrical system. If you turn the key to the accessory position, the entire vehicle will lose power, including the power brakes, power steering, and the newly designed airbag system. Loss of these systems in a moving vehicle is a major violation of federal safety standards, not to mention a huge lawsuit risk. It would behoove you, right, um, to when you're talking to business professionals who don't understand all of the electrical connections in the vehicle, um, to explain to them some of their how this this problem relates to some of their frames of reference to them because they don't understand the sophistication of the circuitry in the car all the ignition switches to them is an on off switch now to an engineer i understand it is not that simple um but you're not dumbing it down if you explain it this way to a business person. You probably wouldn't want to do this if you were explaining this to just a pure engineer, but if you're explaining it to the finance guy, you definitely want B. And so I will end the poll and share your results and continue to click through. Um, and I would say just two more points quickly before we wrap up here. It's also really important, sometimes engineers forget, to interpret the facts when they're writing technical language. I think sometimes um, when we're writing, many of us want to believe that the facts are enough, that they speak for themselves. Um, but in reality, in most business contexts um, and in most engineering teams, even if you're working in more, more of an academic setting, it's really important that you share with all of your team members what you think the significance is. Um, because everybody's going to go to those facts and interpret them in a slightly different way. So you can see above, there's a passage here um, that is largely sort of uninterpreted. It's just a report of how the vehicle stalled while moving moving, but the passage below that's more apt um, reads like this, GM guidelines define safety issues as those that pose a physical threat to vehicle and passenger. They define customer convenience issues as those that cause the customer to spend more time and effort operating the vehicle. On a safety test on June 4th, uh, the driver reported a vehicle stall at highway speed, an incident that is very different from the kinds of stalls GM has formerly labeled customer convenience issues. See, this is a little bit of interpretation here. Though the driver was able to maneuver the car to the side of the road, traffic was relatively light, and so they had ample time and space to respond. The same driver pointed out that in heavier traffic, this incident may have caused a crash, that the, electri uh, that the electrical dashboard lights came on at the time of the incident poses further concern because a failure in the electrical system could mean that the airbags will not deploy. The last four sentences of that are really heavy interpretation. They're really trying to tell the reader what's important um, and why they really need to care. If you fall short of that, your audience is not going to understand. It's not enough. The last thing I'll say is probably an obvious point to you guys. Anyone who has put a figure in a report or used a picture knows the power of pictures. I also teach a graphic design class at Hopkins um, to undergraduates in a variety of fields and then also to uh, STEM graduate students that are working on data visualizations and also conference posters and slides. Um, and and I'm a big proponent of the power of visuals. Here's an example. Sure, I could read this passage to you about the damage sustained to a Chevy Cobalt during a crash, but probably more effective is to show you the picture because you understand much more clearly and quickly what's going on. I'll take you to my final question of the evening. Um, say you and I just, I have to share this and then I have to stop sharing. And now I'm gonna do the final, final poll of the evening. I'm gonna launch this poll and describe this question. Um, if you are a reader here, um, which passage do you think is just gonna be generally a little easier to interpret? Uh, 
A does not have a picture and B has a picture. Um, the difference between A and B too is that B has some interpretation to the data that's given as well. It talks about why it's significant and why the reader should care. So um, the 10.6 millimeter plunger designed in 2005 contains a 5.9 millimeter metal cap and a standard spring, which requires 9.24 newton centimeters of torque. The 12.2 millimeter plunger contains a seven millimeter metal cap and a custom design spring, which requires 17.5 centimeter or 17.57 newton centimeters of torque. Uh, the improved version B, which I see all of you guys are responding to, reads, the 2005 detente plunger was 10.6 10, 10 millimeters long and contained a 5.9 millimeter metal cap attached to a standard off-the-shelf spring. Unfortunately, the torque of this plunger did not meet the technical specifications laid out by GM. To remedy the torque problem, the new 12.2 millimeter plunger contains a 7 millimeter metal cap and a custom design spring which requires 17.57 newton centimeters of torque. Everybody answered question B, and you are correct and I'm sharing the results. And we have about three minutes left in this webinar, which I am using to say that all of the principles that I have discussed tonight, that I've used to assess um, the communication problems at GM, they come from these two books, um, Joshua Schimmel's Writing Style, which is a book that talks about how you tell an eloquent story about research, about engineering projects, and how you make it understandable to a variety of people from um, diverse technologies technical backgrounds. Um, the book covers just sort of techni techniques and rhetoric and narrative, how to piece together an argument around science. Um, and it also covers some sentence level writing techniques, which I brought up at the beginning of the presentation. Those sentence level writing techniques are actually sentence level writing techniques that come from Joseph Williams' style text, which I also strongly recommend. It is not a book that targets a technical audience, uh, but they are absolutely the principles that Joshua Schimmel writes about. Um, the principles are just discussed in a little bit more plain language. The examples are more to do with politics um, and um, some other sort of international relations kinds of uh, examples, as well as some literature too. So you can see what it is about clear writing that's sort of united across all of the disciplines. Um, I guess I've got like two minutes to check out the questions. I am really excited to see what has come up over the course of um, over this conversation. <laughs> yes, some people do actually write like that, Sean. It's amazing. Um, I, when I teach technical writing, there's some engineers I work with who just need a lot of help. Sometimes it happens because English really isn't their native language. Um, I love that George answered Sean. Um, any, oh, I'm curious. I'm not sure that I fully understand Ryan, uh, Ryan's uh, question here. Any person citing a government regulation ever? Um, I don't know. Do you mean like in the, yeah, the recording is going to be posted later on. Um, if um, the person, if Ryan wants to send me an email about um, government regulation. Oh, I see. He was responding to someone else's questions. Oh, what happens when the audience is mixed? Ha ha. When the audience is mixed, this might pain you, but you really need to shoot for the lowest common denominator. Um, so if it's a mixed technical audience, I tell my students that what they need to do is they need to explain the concepts so that um, they probably start from a college level 101 engineering standpoint and build up from there. Um, you will obviously not include all of the details. Um, when you've got a mixed audience in the truest sense, like you've got your grandma in the audience and you've got the PIs in the audience and your important boss people that have a more technical background, um, you're probably going to have to lower the standard even more. Um, I should say, though, what I have found when I work with students that are communicating complicated technical projects to a variety of audiences is that usually the highly technical people in the audience don't really mind when the concept is explained in really simple terms. They also don't think that the speaker is dumb. I know that that's a common fear, especially if you've just come out of graduate school and you're used to getting a lot of criticism from your B PI, who's really trying to train you to be a highly technical human. 
Um, honestly, almost all the PIs that I work with at Hopkins, they really see the mark of effective technical communication as doing the thing that Einstein tells you to do, communicate the idea as simply as humanly possible, but no simpler. That is an art and it takes a ton of practice. Um, I wish you guys all the best of luck out there. I really do recommend these books. Um, if you guys uh, have further questions for me that are maybe not too long-winded, I'm gonna type my email in the chat field. But otherwise, I think that's all the time we have for you tonight. Thank you guys so much for being such wonderful participants. I certainly learned a lot as well and have to say I've been a writer, not so much on the technical side. So it is great to see um, all of the insight you have and shared. So thank you for being with us um, and participating in the webinar as well to students out there. Um, we had a great turnout and I will say goodbye for now. Thanks everyone.